Good morning. morning. My name is Melanie and I'm an elder in the Worship Engagement Committee here at the East Church. It's my great privilege and joy to welcome you all here this morning on this beautiful day, the day that the Lord has made. I'm leading the service this morning along with John. We are delighted to welcome Paul back again to play the organ for us this week. And we are, of course, delighted to welcome you too. I hope you're feeling in good voice today because there's a lot of singing to do. I wonder, when you think of the word neighbour, what comes to your mind? What does that mean to you? Maybe you could take a few moments to discuss this with someone near you in church today. We're going to be talking more later about our neighbours. But for now, let us still our hearts and minds from the busy lives we lead and come before God in worship and praise. When we call, the Lord answers us. Come with thankful hearts. His love endures forever. Let's join our voices together in praise as we sing our first hymn of worship to the Lord our God. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, in rare moments of insight, we try to grasp the beauty and the expansive nature of your love. No words can describe it. No melody contain it. No human being can explain it. Yet we are surrounded by the emblems of your love and grace. In the colors of the sky, in the chaos of the storm, 
in the song of the birds, in the company of the animals, you tell us all will be well. In our moments of great fear, when alone and anxious, you promise to shelter and protect us. Through days of struggle and heartache, joy and achievement, surrounded by the companionship of family and friends, you cover us with a blanket of compassion and kindness. The constancy of your grace overwhelms us. The depth of your love leaves us breathless. Standing at the cross, we are transfixed, gazing. We are troubled, torn and broken. Here, you don't just try to fix us, you mend us. Your outstretched arms have enfolded us in a love we've never known. Your gaze has healed our troubled souls. Your love, the most incredible of all. Let your love now live through us. Amen. We're going to continue to worship God as we sing, When I Needed a Neighbour, Were You There? Good morning. It is a good morning, isn't it? Right, a little update for me on the situation with uh, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, there are now three families have come across, or at least uh, bits of families, and we've had one that has returned. Now, <clears throat> she works for a charity dealing with humanitarian aid, so you can quite understand there's a bit of coming and going. <clears throat> there are another three uh, families uh, expecting refugees to come across, uh, <clears throat> and plans are at various stages uh, and being progressed. Getting one set of refugees across with their dogs has proved to be a bit of a challenge but I can quite empathise that they don't want to leave the dogs behind. 
Um, but uh, it's safe to say that all the steps are now known and are being uh, taken care of. Aberdeenshire Council has been uh, in a starring uh, supportive role and a lot of help has been given by them uh, in a timely manner. All aspects of challenges through from um, getting the necessary uh, uh, documentation sorted out, supporting with finances, uh, English classes, all these sort of things um, have been uh, either uh, directly given by Aberdeenshire Council or uh, they've been put in contact with those that can. Now, the West Church has um, uh, been doing the majority of the work at this point in time, and they've got a WhatsApp um, system that they work with, which is very fast in getting responses. Uh, it's working well, and uh, things like transportation, when transportation is required to go into Aberdeen for biometric testing, uh, and that sort of thing, it's very quick to get somebody who's available at any particular time. So it's something we'll think about doing here at the East Church. I f stupidly thought that it was a social media type setup, but it's not. Um, uh, and I'm going to do a little bit more digging and see how we work in with the West Church or stand alone getting input from the West Church. We have a total of 13 volunteers. Uh, the West Church has double that. So I have no doubt that we can uh, help with whatever numbers do eventually come across. And there's about uh, 10 in prospect uh, at this point in time. That's it for me. I have got a spreadsheet uh, which uh, is a common spreadsheet, so if anybody wants to see that afterwards, just tap me on the shoulder and we can take it from there. Now, could you join us in singing Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You?
I've been asked to do this in my mother tongue. This is a story of a bad Samaritan, a recht course chill of ever I was in. It was on a Jericho road, blood being and all that, we battered him within an inch of his life. He had nothing, but we took it anyway, left him half dead. It's half to leave a man half dead. But it's not the same as killing him. After it all went down, we made our way to the inn and spent what we had, didn't he, from what we hadn't got. And for that ran out, we ran out, well, we were chucked out. I headed back towards Jerusalem. No idea why. A deal must have got into me. I had no business in that city. I usually keep my distance. After an hour or so, I saw a priest coming, walking past me, ashen-faced, like he'd seen a ghost. I clenched my nib as if I was going to take a swipe at him, and he scurried on. I like sending those Jerusalem priests into a tailspin. Out here on the road, it's my temple, my rules. Next, I was passed by another inn. Levite by a look of him. This chancer was giggling to him, say, pure laughing like he'd just seen the funniest thing. I do the same thing as he gets nearer, tense my nibs and drop a shooter towards him, but he didn't flinch, just burst out laughing, as though it was some big joke, which I suppose it was, but it was supposed to be at his expense. Then I see him, wrecked forward, left him. When we left him, he was half dead, but now I do he was half alive. The priest must have passed him by and done nothing. One of his own countrymen, a Levite too, he did less than nothing. As for me, well, I look at doing it, I mean, I didn't do anything either. I'd already done enough. Then I saw another figure in the distance as well. I didn't can fly, but I felt off a chill. So I hid myself like a wee loon. A crouched down in a ditch, and I saw his guy come closer. He didn't look fear like a priest or amused like a Levite, just normal. He muttered something under his breath, but I didn't catch it. Common vagabond like me, probably. You're not going to find anything in this guy, mate. We all read, ready took off, and he didn't hear. But then he pulls him up, binds him up, best he can, and puts him on his donkey like he was talking up his fine brother in battle. Another chill went through me. Oh, who's this guy? I never felt so feared. Me, who fears no one and nothing. I let him pass by and I followed. I have no idea why, but I started following him, hiding and ducking ahead in trees like a dafty. I had to see what he was up to. We got as far as the end, and this guy checks in the pure pile of rugs and bean that are left to him. He gives a wee bag of money and says he'll pay me on return if the bill jacks up. And then he's off. He saved a life and he doesn't even leave his name. He just vanished. I can tell he's a Samaritan, just like me. He doesn't know that guy anything. I rush you after him and I call out, Who do you think you are? Excuse me, this guy says, turning around slowly. Why do you think you are? I'm nebdy, he says. You're near, you just saved that wee guy. He was at death's door. I just did for anybody would a ding, he says, looking shifty. But you didn't. Eh? I saw his end. People walk by, leaving him as good as deed. Look, fix your problem, he starts. So I said, do you think you're some kind of hero? For me, he says, nah, I'm no hero. I'm just a bad Samaritan trying to make amends. And he shrugs and walks off. I thought about chasing him and giving him a piece of my mind, a nib-sized piece. But there was that dread I could hardly move. I watched him walking a war in the distance. This guy, half my size. And I hid back along the road to Jerusalem. He'd rattling we are, it's happened. I didn't see another soul until I get there. As I come to the city gates, I see this wee guy bashed up outside it was, just leaning there. Ah, oh, blood and bean. It seems to be the next for it. 
Nobody has come down and helped them out. So I do, but anybody would have done, because I'm a bad Samaritan. Could you join me in singing hymn 543, Longing for the Night, Light We Wait in Darkness? Our New Testament reading today comes from Luke chapter 10, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 10, verses 25 to 27. I'm reading from the message. Listen for the word of God. Just then, a religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I 
need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do it and you'll live. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religion scholar responded. Jesus said, go and do the same. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May these words of my heart and the meditation of my mind be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and redeemer. Amen. We've just heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus told this to answer a question on how we would define our neighbor. This parable is as relevant today to me as it was when it was first told. We live in a world where good neighbors are very much needed and maybe in short supply. Or are they? The story of the Good Samaritan and the story John told of the Bad Samaritan are examples that expose the realities of how flawed things can be in our world. But it also shows the goodness of people too. We are those people, the characters in this parable. We are pilgrims on a journey and companions on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. All our lives are filled with journeys, some of them easy, comfortable and fun, some of them hard and lonely, painful even. The whole world is also on a journey and is often, as now, filled with conflicts between peoples and nations where vast numbers of families and children are displaced by war and by economies which produce ever greater inequalities across the whole spectrum of society and its structures. The world moves at such a rapid pace. Do we become hardened by the sights we see, the atrocities which surround us, is it easier not to notice these, to walk by looking the other way? The man in the parable was on a journey. He was beaten and robbed, but he wasn't alone. Others were there. There are many ways in which we can justify looking the other way. We might feel scared. That's totally valid. Maybe this was a trap and we would end up getting hurt ourselves. This isn't my responsibility, we might think. Someone else will help. At the start of this passage, Jesus asked, is asked, what do I need to do to get eternal life? What a wonderful question this is, and one that we might all like to know the answer to. Don't we all long for fullness of life? 
and we certainly don't wish to be alone. Well, the answer seems simple. We need to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. This answer is written in God's law. This was the answer given by the expert and the answer most of us who know the Bible would probably give today if we were asked the same thing. Surely we can do that. After all, love is easy, isn't it? There were other ways the expert might have responded to Jesus, but he goes straight to the heart of things. He quotes a passage of scripture that is the very heart of Jewish worship. It is recited in every synagogue service to this day, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6. Good answer, Jesus said, do it and you will live. Let's just take that first part and talk a bit about love. It's certainly easy to say we love someone or something. We say it every day about so many things. Oh, I love it when it's hot like today. Some people might love it when it's cold. I love bananas or I love chocolate. Don't you just love my new trainers? Of course, we probably really enjoy all these things, but love them. So it's also then quite easy to say, yes, we love God. Easy to say, but is it easy to follow through? Love is such a wonderful thing. When I was pregnant with my second child, I was worried because I thought there was no way I could love any baby as much as I loved my firstborn. As soon as my new baby girl was born, I loved her with that all-encompassing and overwhelming love that we have for our children. And of course, I still love my eldest and my youngest child too, all equally and all differently. And for those of us blessed with grandchildren or great-grandchildren, you know this ability to increase your capacity for love continues endlessly. That is the amazing thing about love, especially amongst people. Loving one person does not dilute your love for another. Of course, it's easy to love those we choose to, our family and our friends, and we're Christians and have also chosen to love God. We're here today in church gathered as a people of God to worship and praise him because we know him, we love him. We also know as Christians just as the religious scholar says, that loving God and having faith in God also has ethical dimensions. When answering Jesus, the scholar does not just say to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, but he adds to love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. This is taken from Leviticus chapter 19. You shall not take vengeance nor hold grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This expert and Jesus seem to be completely on the same page. This is the same thing that Jesus had been preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Love God, love others. But this brings us to the trickier part, to also love our neighbor. The scholar then asked Jesus how he would define our neighbor. And this is something we need to answer too. Who do we define as our neighbor? The people who live next door to us, yes, of course. But neighbor is so much more than that. Jesus answers with a very human story, and I'm sure one we can all understand and relate to. There are many people in the story Jesus tells to illustrate how to love our neighbor. People like us who all acted very differently. The priest and the Levite, the ones we would possibly expect to help, but who looked the other way and walked on by. And the Samaritan, who had most reason to just pass this Jew, his enemy if you like. <clears throat> but he couldn't do that. He was moved to act. He showed compassion. Loving God is about acting on a need when we see one. 
It's not enough to just feel sorry and to acknowledge the need. We need to take action too. Our neighbor is not just someone we are physically near to. Our neighbor is someone we choose to come near to. We've heard in the news for months now and for David here today of a need from our neighbors, refugees from Ukraine. The Samaritan chose to make this injured man his neighbor. We need to think about making choices too. We are called to open our eyes just as the Samaritan did and not hurry on by where we see a need. This can be very hard. It can be scary and it may cost us something too. Financially, yes, most probably. And with the rising cost of living crisis, this is hard, but also it will cost us time, a most valuable thing. It isn't enough just to see the need. We need to act on it. The Samaritan saw the need and he answered it. He brought comfort, he bandaged the wounds, he acted with compassion and care. He went that step further and put the man on his donkey, meaning he was left to walk. We don't know how far it was to the inn, but it might have been a very long way. And then he passes his neighbor into the hands of someone else who can continue to care for him. He spends his money and his time to make sure his neighbor is well looked after. The Samaritan then followed through with his commitment to care for his neighbor this, I believe, is what we are being asked to do, to demonstrate our love for God. We should use our mind to make conscious acts to help our neighbor. We should use our will to make compassionate choices to show we care, ones where we follow through, where we actually cross the road to make someone our neighbor. This, I believe, is what is meant by loving our neighbor. It might be quite hard to love our neighbors. Sometimes we just don't wish to love those we see as unlovable at all. And for all of us, it will be harder to love some people than it is to love others. Who we love is very personal to us. But we are asked to love all our neighbors. There are many ways we can do this. And I'm sure we all do. Giving to a charity for those in need, giving to the food bank, volunteering our help, a cheery smile, a needed phone call or chat, and there are so many other ways. We can and we do, we all do that, and that is great. But showing acts of love to people we either don't know, or maybe we do know and don't really get on with, that can be much harder. How can we be expected to love everyone? The story of the Good Samaritan is an old one, but it never loses its meaning. I thank God that if we take a look around, we can see this story being lived out every day. We see many who inconvenience themselves and even endanger their own lives to help their neighbor having first made the choice that this person is their neighbor by coming alongside them. Yes, there is so much evil in the world, but there is also so much goodness showing that our societies are not permanently broken. They can be and they are restored. We all have a part to play in this, however small. We can all be the traveler in the story who helps his neighbor. Sometimes we may not be the traveler in the story. We may be the one in need of help. Thankfully, we are not alone. We have Jesus by our side every step of the way. We also have other neighbors on our journey who are there to help us. We have our faith. We love Jesus by believing him and by believing in him. If we follow this through, then by his grace and power, we will be able, able to love our neighbors as he wishes us to.
Which of the three became, became the neighbor, Jesus asked? The one who treated him kindly. So let us all go and do the same. Amen. We continue to worship God as we receive the offering. Please join me in prayer. Lord, bless this our offering. We give what we can to continue the good works in your church. We give what we can to you whilst knowing that what we offer is not just money. Although money is sorely needed, we offer to you our time, our talent, our service, our all, and we ask your blessing as we do so. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, today we gather here with our neighbours to pray for our neighbours not just those who gather here today, but all those throughout Bankery and the world who gather in your name. We pray we may be like the Good Samaritan and draw close to help others where we see a need. Let us pray for members of the community who work and serve the common good sustain and strengthen all those who work tirelessly for the good of others. We pray especially for those who are part of the emergency services, doctors and nurses, and all the support staff who work in the NHS, those in the armed forces, for police, and those involved in the security of the realm. Give understanding and wisdom to teachers and administrators and all who work in our education system, all politicians and individuals who seek to serve. Raise up in our land, O Lord, leaders and others who are willing to serve, not for their own benefit, but for the good of our communities and all those who are oppressed and forgotten. Let us pray for world peace as we remember countries throughout the world where there is tension and unrest. Grant to our leaders the wisdom to make right decisions and to confront evil with good and in doing so may love cover a multitude of sins and allow justice and peace to blossom. Hear our prayers as we name those communities in our hearts today. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the families and friends. Lord, bless and prosper our families and friends. Give to each of us the insight to know when to speak and when to be silent to know when to offer help and when help is required without someone asking. Be close to those we know who are struggling with ill health and facing an uncertain future. 
Grant us the wisdom to know what to say and how to respond to their needs. Give perseverance to all those who are enduring difficult times in frustrating relationships and challenging workplaces. Give strength to those who feel they are running out of options and feel unable to carry on. Inspire us with opportunities to carry out deeds of kindness without ever being rewarded, except for knowing that what we do is to bring glory to your name. Lord, hear our prayers. We give thanks to you, O God, for your unfailing goodness. We pray for your church, that she would be a place of true worship, a shelter and refuge for all in need of your grace. As we seek to reform and reshape, we pray for your spirit to guide and inspire the Church of Scotland at every level. And we pray for this church, Bank Return and East, for all those meeting in person and for communities that are formed online. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray that all may know your presence and guidance. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear us now as we join together, saying the words Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Can we raise the roof by singing hymn 153, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
We remember before you all who have joined in worship throughout the world today. Those in cathedrals and places of great historical heritage and those who have gathered around a kitchen table. We pray that unity among your people might be the common calling of your church. We pray that unity in unity we might go out into the world to make disciples, declaring your love for all creation. May the power of the Father of Lights illuminate our minds. The presence of the Eternal Son embolden our voices and gifts of the Spirit of grace shape our action. And the blessing of Father, Son and Holy Spirit journey with us evermore.